I'm Dr. Luke Wells Smith from Motion Equine Centre, and today EQ Saturday has asked me to give a bit of a talk about um, what I term the owner's guide to laminitis. Um, it's a talk I've given a couple of times in different places, uh, given it at Equitana before, and um, I think I've given it online. But every year I kind of, uh, you know, rejig it and do little bits and pieces differently. And I think whenever we're dealing with laminitis, um, it's been a bit of an evolution for me. I think I remember treating my first laminitic pony when I was a teenager, giving it a bit of a trim would have been like, you know, nearly 20 years ago. So I've been playing around with laminitic courses for a while. So it's a, it's a topic that I really enjoy uh, and something I'm really passionate about. So we'll get a bit of a start happening here. So just a little bit of a quick introduction to Motion Equine Centre. So no doubt most of you in the local community have seen we've rolled out this uh, sort of new program over the last 12 months. So. It's basically myself and uh, an Anushka. Anushka is a, a vet who spent a lot of time in Europe, particularly working with high level performance horses. And one of Anushka's real interests is sort of back associated lamenesses. So, you know, stiff neck, um, saddle fit and, and pelvic issues. So she's been really great uh, to be part of the team. And what we've sort of been trying to do over the last 12 months is really look at a holistic approach to the performance horse for people. Um, we've obviously, um, you know, both Anushka and I have been involved in, in lamenesses, but it's a sort of service that we're providing where both, you know, you get me looking at their foot related stuff and Anushka looking at the axial skeleton, so neck, back and pelvis. And then, you know, we, we work the horses up, use gait analysis, see how they're moving. And then, you know, we can sort of tailor any treatments or diagnostics that kind of, um, that, that we need to, to improve the performance of, of the horse essentially. So we're located here in Kilmore, obviously opposite the racetrack, and like a, a few of you have probably realised the race course just recently um, fenced off the block adjacent to us, so getting parking in, in, inside the facility is a little bit tricky, but we're kind of working on that at the moment. Um, this month, or actually until the end of um, October, we're rolling out this new, uh, what I've called the Laminitis Monitoring Program, which is, we'll talk a little bit about it later, and, and you'll see sort of the benefits of it a bit throughout this talk. But it's basically having a consult with me, taking some foot x-rays of all four feet, and we've been lucky enough recently to import a uh, stall side insulin test. So I don't know if any of you have had insulin tests done on your horses in the past, but usually we pull blood and have to send it away and we get the results a couple of days later. So we've actually imported a test where we can pull the bloods and have the results in 15 minutes. So it's a really exciting technology. It's actually a buddy of mine's company from the US and um, yeah, we just brought that into Australia. So for spring, this, this is a really timely talk and a really timely thing to be doing insulin tests on any of our horses that may have laminitis. So um, this is the basics of the talk. I'll probably leave questions to the end and then we can just kind of roll through it because we are under a little bit of a schedule and, and sometimes I do go on a little bit. So um, basically the talk will be about what is laminitis, what's the timeline associated with developing laminitis, what are the risk factors, how we diagnose it and how we can treat it. Can everyone hear me all right? Am I speaking loud enough? Okay, cool. So just, just a quick <coughs> anatomy lesson. Um, we don't have a pointer, so I'll just jump up so everyone can kind of see. So this is a cross section of the lower limb of the horse. This is the pedal bone, the short pastern, the long pastern bone, a navicular bone sitting in here. This is a really important structure, our deep digital flexor tendon, and we've got our hoof wall, and between our pedal bone and our hoof wall is our lamellar attachment. So these finger-like projections that suspend the pedal bone within the hoof capsule. And they're really, you know, in the normal healthy footed horse, our pedal bone is nicely connected to our hoof wall through our lamellar attachment and the ground surface and our tendon, which is running across here, anchoring the toe of the foot to the ground surface, all kind of work in, in uh, harmony together. And obviously we'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide, but laminitis will be um, the, the, the inflammation and subsequent breakdown of this attachment between the hoof wall and the pedal bone. Here's our frog, our digital cushion. So we're really today focusing on this whole section here, our pedal bone, our tendon, and our lamellar attachment and our hoof wall um, is what we'll basically be talking about for most of the talk. 
So what is laminitis? And we just break down the word and make it really simple. So the, the first half of it is talking about the laminae, like that finger-like projections that we were talking about, holding the pedal bone to the hoof wall, and then itis is inflammation. And so really just we're talking about that inflammation of this, of this attachment. And some people like to term laminitis founder, and some people think that founder and laminitis are kind of two different things. But the way I kind of break it down, we'll start talking about the different stages of laminitis, developmental, acute, and then chronic, and it all kind of fits together uh, in that. But if you ever hear about you know, someone saying that my horse is founded, we're really talking about laminitis and some sort of inflammatory process that's going on between the hoof wall and the pedal bone. So again, this is a cross-sectional image. This, this image here, I used to spend a lot of time doing anatomy dissections when I lived in New South Wales. And what we used to do is, is take, you know, obviously a deceased horse leg, and we used to heat the foot up in a, in a bucket of boiling water, and the hoof capture would actually just come off really nicely. It would actually separate this lamella attachment from the pedal bone. And, it's a little bit hard on the projector, but you can kind of see these lots of little folds. This is, you know, the internal structure of that lamella attachment, uh, these tiny little folds of the lamella that are all sort of interdigitating together. And this is um, obviously a very chronic, severe laminitic foot. This is one of the brood mares that uh, we worked on in the Hunter Valley. Um, you can see all of, you know, when you start getting into the chronic phase of laminitis, we start to get all of this fibrous tissue trying to, you know, hold that pedal bone into the hoof wall. But obviously, once it starts to get to this point, which is very severe, you know, the, the foot can't really function very well. And depending on, you know, the, the, the stage and the severity of the case, you know, laminitis clinical signs can range from being very mild. You know, sometimes we hear from owners, oh, my horse, you know, goes a little bit shuffly after it's been shot or it's a little bit uh, short strided. But then we can obviously get into the more severe cases where, you know, they're laying down a lot, um, they're very painful, it's very difficult to deal with. And, and in some cases, you know, laminitis is very transient, you know, particularly in, in some of our little ponies. It seems like they eat a couple of blades of grass, go a little bit sore for a couple of days, we give them some anti-inflammatories and they seem to go on living okay. Whereas some other horses develop laminitis and it's much more of a lifelong type scenario, which we'll talk a little bit more about later as well. So the timeline for laminitis, and, and there's really three stages, developmental, acute, and then we head into the chronic phase. So developmental is when the horse is being exposed to risk factors. So they're, they're not showing any clinical signs of laminitis, they're happy, healthy, um, you know, we see this a lot in the, in, in, in the hospital where we might have a horse that's sick, maybe it's retained its placenta, maybe it's got diarrhea, maybe it's got something going on. And for all intensive purposes, it's totally happy and healthy, but it's being exposed to a lot of these risk factors associated with, with, with laminitis. And in the developmental stage, there's really no clinical signs whatsoever. And here's a radiograph of a horse's foot. Um, you know, everything all looks really healthy. There's no evidence of rotation. The lamellar attachment looks really healthy. The horse is standing there, no problem. One of the issues in the developmental phase though is if your foot looks like this, which looks pretty beat up and not very healthy in the first place, that's one of the risk factors for developing laminitis later on in, 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 uh, in the whole process. So if you start with a horse with a bad foot, it's really unhealthy, uh, if they do develop laminitis, that's a real big problem for them. So the horse has been exposed to some risk factors and now it's developed clinical signs of laminitis. And so now we're starting to see the horse might be shifting weight constantly, may have increased digital pulses to its feet, maybe laying down. Um, this acute phase, it's sort of like one day your weight, you know, one day your horse was okay, the next day it's shifting weight and it's sore. It's a really rapid onset once the acute phase starts. And, you know, scientifically, we term the acute phase basically from time zero for 72 hours or three days. So the acute phase is very short and it's all to do with the inflammatory process associated with, with the lamella attachment. Well, that was a bit. That, that was a little bit drastic, that little animation there of the pedal bone falling through. But 
when, when we do develop acute laminitis, we do start to get some displacement of our pedal bone within the hoof capsule. So then we head into the chronic phase, and if anyone's had a laminitic course, you know, a lot of the times this is what we'll see. This is what we're trying to manage. And these, these are cases where the lamellar inflammation has gone on for longer than three days. It's very rare that we have a case that goes from developing acute laminitis and not having any clinical signs after three days. You know, that there's, always, there's usually something that's going on. There's probably only a handful of cases that I've seen over the years that developed an acute episode of laminitis and then they seem to be totally fine after that. It, you know, it's very, very rare. A lot of the times, we're not getting under control that underlying risk factor. So chronic cases are over three days. Um, and then I term them, they're either unstable or stable. And what that basically means is if, if they're unstable, their x-ray findings and their clinical signs continue to get worse or they don't really get any better. If they're stable, they tend to be growing new hoof capsule, they're regenerating their lamellar attachment, hopefully their pain's under control, they're a more of a stable case. So once I get into the chronic phase, they're either unstable or stable depending on where, where they're kind of at. And then in the chronic phase, they develop this thing called a lamellar wedge. And this is this triangular area here. This again is a, an x-ray of a horse's foot. There's our pedal bone, navicular bone, short past and long past, and then here's our hoof wall. Obviously, these two cases here are very chronic and they're very severe. So we've had some significant uh, rotation of the pedal bone. It's tipping towards the ground surface. We don't have a lot of sole depth. Um, the wall's running in a totally different direction to the pedal bone, and all of this is filling in with some fibrous keratin tissue. It's not very organized. Um, so these are, these are very chronic sort of cases. This horse here though, has actually started to grow down a new growth ring from the coronary band. Whereas this horse, which has probably a similar degree of both bony column rotation and hoof capsule rotation, it hasn't quite started growing yet. So this horse would be relatively unstable in my mind, whereas this horse, although it looks pretty severe, I could say, okay, this horse, you know, is actually starting to grow some new hoof capsule down. Um, and we talk about, you know, a lot of horses in the chronic phase. And what I find is if they've developed laminitis, they've gone through the acute phase and they've started to get into the chronic phase, we've got this real window of like six to eight weeks where they can be going along sort of up and down, kind of not quite right. And then they can get really severe after that if we don't manage them correctly. So there's this sort of real window of opportunity to treat these cases. You know, if I start dealing with cases that haven't, haven't been managed very well for eight weeks, they're in a lot of trouble by the time we get to see them. Oh, it's just one of those animations. So, sort of mentioned it before, but if your horse develops acute laminitis, you're really not out of the woods until sort of six to eight weeks pe a period of time. And this, this was a very severe case of laminitis. This is a special type of x-ray, this is called a venogram, where we actually inject uh, radio opaque or special dye that we can see on x-ray. And we can see all the blood supply to the pedal bone, to the coronary band, to the lamellar attachment, and to the sole. And this was in the very acute initial phase this was a brood bear that had retained her placenta and developed acute laminitis and she already had a bit of lamella tearing and we were sort of grumbling along and trying to get her to the point where she was going a lot better. However, over that sort of six to eight week mark and up to 12 weeks, we ended up, you know, just significantly deteriorating. She didn't grow any new hoof wall down from the coronary band. She didn't grow any new sole. So if you're in this period of time where you also developed an acute episode of laminitis and is now in the chronic phase, this is a really important time to be managing them. So what are these risk factors? I've mentioned them a couple of times and it's really about the causes of laminitis, the underlying causes. We know that laminitis is inflammation and breakdown of that lamellar attachment, but what actually causes it? And there's three categories of risk factors. There's hormone associated, sepsis or toxic associated, and then we've got the overload. So hormone associated laminitis cases, these account for 90% of all the laminitis cases that we see. And so they've got an underlying metabolic condition. They've either got Cushing's or uh, PPID, or they've got equine metabolic syndrome or EMS. EMS is something that's kind of 
you know, when I was going through university, they were just starting to talk about it. And the best way to describe EMS in horses, it's like type two diabetes in people. Their insulin's being produced, but their insulin doesn't work very well. Insulin's role in the body is to take glucose out of the bloodstream so we can use it as an energy source. And so these horses with EMS have all of this insulin running around, but it's not picking up any of the glucose within the bloodstream. Um, and so they're starting to you know, turn that into fat, and that's why a lot of our EMS cases are you know, these real easy doers. You know, they get the big crusty neck, they get fat bulges over their eyes, um, they put on weight really easily. Um, they, these are the sort of horses that, that have this equine metabolic syndrome. But if we think about them as a type two diabetic patient, we know that you know if you've got type two diabetes, you can't go and you know chug two, two liters of coke. It's got a lot of sugar in it. Same with these guys. You know we can't let these ponies or these horses with equine metabolic syndrome have any form of, of sugar or uh, either water soluble or 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 starch. And Holly will go a little bit into that, I suppose, when she starts talking about the nutrition for these horses as well. Equine Cushing's disease, on the other hand, now, I think, you know, both equine metabolic syndrome and Cushing's are all kind of a little bit related. They're all associated with the, the body's production of hormones. I think some horses that have had EMS for a number of years can also go on to develop Cushing's, whether they already had Cushing's and that's why they have EMS, you know, there's a whole, whole spectrum to look at with these guys. But equine Cushing's disease is where the horse develops a benign tumor in their brain around a structure called the hypothalamus, which is really important, oh, sorry, the pituitary gland, which is really important for uh, producing a lot of the hormones that the body uses just to regulate itself. And so um, one of the things that we look at when we're testing a horse for Cushing's is this thing called ACTH, which can be very elevated in these horses. So uh, Cushing's typically is an older horse um, disease However, I've diagnosed it in ponies as young as six years of age. I think in the younger horses, it's more of a transient condition. So we might start them on a medication and we can kind of wean them off a little bit later. But in our older horses, you know, if they're 20 plus years old, um, they've got a shaggy hair coat and they've developed laminitis and some of them don't put on weight and some of them do. Uh, a lot of those horses are worthwhile testing them for Cushing's. Like we sort of alluded to recently, testing our pony or testing our horses with equine metabolic syndrome uh, the blood test is basically taking an insulin test um, so we pull some blood and we can use this new special test called the wellness ready to to uh, basically go um, uh, basically test the blood's uh, insulin level Ooh, the, let's just turn off the sound somehow because i'm not sure there's a sound coming out of that So um, we can use, uh, pull some blood from the horse and we can either use this wellness ready test which gives us a result in about 15 minutes or we can send it off to the lab and get a result. And so when I'm testing horses for equine metabolic syndrome, uh, what we used to do is used to starve them overnight, take a baseline in the morning and then feed them a specific amount of glucose to actually challenge the body and to see whether the insulin was actually working or not. I've kind of changed the way that I do this now. Instead of fasting them and giving them a bunch of sugar and testing them, what I basically say to people is, okay, feed them as you normally would, give them their hard feed if they're having a hard feed, and about two hours later, we'll pull the blood and see what their insulin's doing. And that gives us a little bit more of a dynamic understanding so if you're feeding this particular diet and your horse is having these really high insulin spikes after it, it tells us one, their insulin's not working very well, but it also tells us that maybe our diet has a little bit too much sugar in it as well. So I think doing these tests has been really interesting over the last few years and we're really starting to get to the bottom of it. So like we mentioned, these horses are susceptible to what we call non-structural carbohydrates, so water soluble, carbohydrates and starch, so water solubles with simple sugars. Um, and there used to be this whole, under, this whole thought process that feeds that were high in protein also caused our horse to have laminitis. But 
I think now that we've analysed a lot of pasture and a lot of hay, we've actually realised, and now we know that EMS is all part of the picture, we've actually realised that maybe it's not the protein, maybe some of these pastures and hays are actually high in both, the high in protein and in sugars. So I think we've started to work <coughs> through all of that. So exercise is obviously important for horses with EMS, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But one of the things that we do find and we had a really weird spike of laminitis cases in at the clinic uh, in January uh, this year, is if we have a horse that maybe has some EMS, low grade, subclinical, we don't really know that it's there, and we give them some time off and we stop exercising them, say over the Christmas break, but we're still feeding them the same level and the same, the same feed, that can kind of tip some of these horses into having uh, EMS episode which ends up causing laminitis in the end. Um, the other thing to think about with hormone associated laminitis, um, some of you might be aware that you know for some conditions in the horse like if they're having an allergic reaction um, or for, for intraarticular into the joint uh, steroid use for osteoarthritis, horses that have some underlying EMS and are given a steroid can also uh, trigger a laminitic episode. So it's just something to be aware of in this whole hormone associated laminitis. Sepsis associated laminitis this is what we see in the hospital more commonly. Um, so the horse might present with diarrhea, pneumonia, might have had colic surgery, might have just had a foal and retained its membranes, but it can also be associated with a grain overload or, or pasture associated laminitis, particularly if they're fermenting a lot of these non-structural carbohydrates. Sepsis or toxic laminitis cases the prognosis is a lot worse than if we're dealing with our metabolic type cases. Um, if the whole, basically what happens in these cases is they've got this area of sepsis, they're shedding off all these inflammatory, what we call cytokines or mediators, they've got bacteria running through their system, and unfortunately in the horse, all of that culminates in inflammation around the blood vessels that supply the hooves. And that's basically what triggers this massive inflammatory response within the hoof capsule. So sepsis associated laminitis cases, if your horse is sick and it develops laminitis, that's a really big problem. If they've got EMS or if they've got Cushing's, they've usually had some chronic changes over a period of time, we can manage those. These sepsis associated cases are very difficult to try and manage, uh, particularly if they become severe. The final risk factor is this overload. Um, we typically see this again in the hospital. This horse here has fractured its fetlock and it's got this massive plate in there. And so obviously this is really painful for the horse and they've got to bear all their weight on the opposite leg. And so this, you know, this long-term overloading the lamellar attachment on the support limb can um, cause this uh, um, support limb laminitis. And unfortunately, again, that usually happens in that four to six, you know, six to eight week period that foot is just chronically overloaded and it starts to develop laminitis, which is just a horrible feeling because you know, you, you've saved the horse, you've fixed its, its broken leg, and then the, the support limb, um, you know, it, it starts to deteriorate, which is a big problem for them. Um, fortunately, we don't see road founder that often anymore because we've kind of stopped uh, running horses down bitumen roads. But occasionally, if horses escape and they do go running down a hard surface and galloping around, they can develop what we call road founder, where their foot's just really, really inflamed and their lamellar attachment gets involved uh, because they're running, running on a very hard surface over a short period of time. So in many cases, particularly the severe ones, we start to see a combination of risk factors. So if I see an overweight pregnant broodmare that then develops, you know, um, placentitis or develops, which is, you know, infection around their placenta or develops a retained membrane, see how now we've got a number of risk factors all stacking up on top of each other. And these cases become very difficult to kind of deal with. We have a horse with a fractured leg and then the implants get infected and they get a big infection then you know, these cases are also very difficult to deal with. So once we start getting you know, all these different risk factors stacking up on each other, we can see some really, um, really severe cases that are really tricky to kind of deal with. So probably the most important part for this is you know, how to diagnose <coughs> laminitis and what us as owners can kind of do to 
to look at these horses with laminitis and then we'll talk a little bit about the veterinary diagnostics that we can do. This slide's pretty busy, um, but you know, as an owner, it's really important to monitor your horse for any signs of lameness, obviously. Um, like we discussed, laminitis can present from being very mild. You know, you might only see a shuffly gait at the trot. <coughs> they might not be doing the typical weight shifting, laying down, all those sort of things. But if you do notice that your horse is not quite right or not moving very well, it's the middle of spring, they're putting on weight, the grass is really green, you should start thinking about potentially it's got laminitis. Um, some horses with laminitis, yes, it is very severe. They'll shift weight, they're laying down more often. You know, that, that's one of the signs that we see with, with particularly horses that are out in the paddock all the time. Um, you know, the owner calls up and they say, oh, my horse has been lying down a lot. Uh, maybe it's got colic. We go out there, it's the middle of spring. Actually, no, they don't have colic. They've got, you know, inflamed hooves and they've got some laminitis. So um, if you've got them in the stable and they're in the paddock, horses naturally shift from one leg to the other. But if you notice your horse is constantly weight shifting back and forth, that's a sign that they're developing laminitis. And if when you're going to pick their feet up, you know, they're, they're finding it difficult to stand on one leg over the other, that can be another sign. The um, digital pulses. So on, on this image here, we've got the whole leg in there, or the whole lower leg in there. The digital pulse is kind of like what I would describe as you know, if you've ever hit your thumb with a hammer and you've got that throbbing feeling, like it's like you can kind of feel the blood going through there. Well, I think when you have a really severe inflammatory response within your foot, um, you know, for these horses, they also start to get some of those um, throbbing blood vessels that we can actually feel them just around the back of the uh, sesamoid. So if you run your finger across the back of your, your fetlock on either side, you'll actually feel the palmodigital vein, artery and nerve. And it'll kind of feel like a couple of little threads there. And if you place your fingers over there, you'll be able to feel the blood coursing through there. Now, in some horses, they can have digital pulses, very mild, and if, you've got, if you're very sensitive with this, you can pick it up. But if, you're not very, if you haven't done this very often, you can easily feel a pulse to one or more feet, well then you know there must be some inflammation going on within the foot. Um, when I say, you know, when we're talking about laminitis, it's obviously a systemic type thing. It's a whole body type scenario. So typically horses will have at least digital pulses to both forelimbs, usually in the forelimbs because we have about 60% of our weight bearing force going over the forelimbs, but we may start getting increased pulses in all four legs. One of the exceptions to that is you know, sometimes if we have a horse with a foot abscess that's just lame on one leg, they'll just have a pulse to one leg. So that can be a little bit of a way to identify what's kind of going on. Another thing to look at is, um, we've got a few images here, but if you start actually looking at your horse's feet, you know, get them out of the mud, washing them off and having a look, you'll start to see if the horse has got, you know, chronic inflammation and chronic laminitis, they'll start to develop these little growth rings on their hoof capsule. So this pony here has got lots and lots of these little growth rings because it constantly is having all of these inflammatory episodes. Because it's a pony, it tends to grow more heel and it's obviously got some hoof wall distortion and some laminitis going on. And what we'll start to see is those growth rings are actually wider at the heel because it's growing really rapidly and narrower at the toe. And that's where most of our laminitis is starting to occur. So just physically checking out your horse's feet is really important. This is uh, actually a warm blood from a number of years ago that had underlying EMS. Didn't quite have laminitis, but it definitely had lots and lots of tiny little growth rings stacking up. So you know, it had a crest, it had a really big fat cresty neck, sort of had a history of being a bit shuffly. Um, it would go sore after it was trimmed. And it's probably because it just didn't really have a healthy hoof capsule and it was just chronically being inflamed all the time. Some of the more obvious things that you'll see is this image here of the horse with a really stretched white line. So as that lamellar attachment starts to break down and that whole foot starts growing out, the white line, which is the junction between the sole and the hoof wall, also starts to stretch. So if you see your horse with this sort of stretching through the toe um, this, and, and there's mud and debris getting jammed in here, well then you know you've got some stretching of your white line. Um, in more severe cases, you can start to see the sole will start to bulge out the bottom. But these are obviously very severe cases. They're going to be very painful 
um, and hopefully you've got your vet involved if you start to see something like that. And one of the other things that we see, particularly in chronic laminitis cases that have been going on for a number of months, potentially years, they are very susceptible to, be, to developing abscesses. And they will develop an abscess after abscess, sometimes in multiple feet. And a lot, of, a lot of that's to do with the blood supply to the hook capsule and potentially some damage around the sole and underlying uh, little blood vessels underneath there. So the laminitis horse that develops a foot abscess is not like your regular healthy horse that's running around out in the paddock that gets a foot abscess because they get a little bit of debris tracking up their white line. Laminitis case is more associated with growth and damage of the underlying um, sensitive tissue. So this is just a video of a horse. Uh, this horse uh, had, was, was very severe, obviously. We're actually out in the paddock taking x-rays of this horse because it couldn't really move. But this horse is constantly weight shifting. It's sort of rocking back on its heels, really doesn't want to move. And so when we start to see that sort of gait, uh, that sort of stance, we know we could be dealing with a horse with laminitis. So from a, a veterinarian and a, and a farrier standpoint, standpoint, how do we kind of diagnose laminitis? Well, again, a lot of it comes back to the history. We're trying to identify those risk factors. Does the horse have an underlying metabolic condition? Has it been sick recently? Or has it, you know, could it be a potentially an overload or a support limb laminitis? The clinical signs, we sort of talked about those, the increased digital pulses, the weight shifting, laying down, the lameness, all those sort of things are important. Um, as vets and farriers, we'll obviously have our hoof testers. Um, and so some horses that develop laminitis will be painful to hoof testers over the toe. But just because a horse isn't painful to hoof testers doesn't mean that it doesn't have laminitis. So we could be in the middle of summer, the horse may have retained all its sole and it's really thick and hard, and we can use the hoof testers as much as we want, but we can't apply enough pressure to um, you know, elicit a pain response. So hoof testers are definitely helpful, but just because your horse isn't showing a pain response to using them doesn't mean that they don't have laminitis. Um, the next thing to think about is doing x-rays. Um, so these are obviously two x-rays that are giving us a pretty clear picture. If we've, we're in the acute phase, the horse is, you know, three days to develop this laminitic episode, hopefully we're not going to start seeing stuff like this. These cases are very chronic, and if your horse has never had laminitis and we take an x-ray of it, its foot's probably going to look pretty normal. But we will start to see some subtle changes. The lamellar attachment can start to get a little bit stretched in this region, and this is what happens over that six to eight week period that I was talking about. That stretching becomes worse and worse and it starts to fatigue. So if we do x-rays, the horse has never had laminitis before, its foot's probably not gonna look like that, particularly in the acute phase. But as that lamina, uh, the, the foot becomes more unstable and that tearing becomes worse, well then we'll start to see this bony column rotation, our hoof capsule rotation, the lamella wedge forming, minimal sole, we'll start to see this big um, you know, heel starting to grow. Uh, X-rays are also really helpful for monitoring what we're gonna do. So it can be helpful for uh, the trim, what are we gonna trim off of this foot, how much heel are we gonna take off, what sort of shoe are we gonna apply, we can take the X-rays before we trim and shoe, we can take them after, and then we can also take them at the end of the shoeing cycle. Did our shoe actually do something? Did the horse actually improve its sole growth and grow some new hoof ball down? Or is the horse's foot growth totally stalled out and it's just not growing, which is a big problem for them. So our leader, Dan, if your horse shows any signs of laminitis, you must take x-rays. And I think, you know, within reason, but I think most of the time, um, if they are develop, if they have developed laminitis and they haven't responded to anti-inflammatories, having a set of x-rays can give you so much information. It can tell you what their hoof health was like, did that, you know, can identify if they've had some chronic laminitis. Um, and it can also help us guide what are we going to do uh, for these horses in terms of, you know, what shoe we're going to use. This is one, uh, uh, a, um, a slide mainly that I do, do for vets and vet students, but um, it's really important to have a very consistent technique when we're taking x-rays of horses' feet. Ideally, we don't want to be taking x-rays out in the paddock like I was with that horse that couldn't move. 
but if they're if they're on a if they're on a flat you know concrete area if you've got to have the x-rays done at home hopefully they're in a garage or something or in the stable so that they can stand uh, on a flat surface and when we do take x-rays of a horse's feet it's really important to stand them on blocks of equal height and the reason that we do that is so that we can actually see all the sole and the wall and everything if the horse's foot was sitting on the ground the x-ray generator can't get close enough so we'll you know cut half of the foot off so they need to stand on these blocks to be elevated so that we can see everything that's going on like i alluded to before the the four limbs the front legs are more likely and the front feet are more likely to develop laminitis but we do see laminitic changes in the hind feet as well so if you're going to get foot x-rays most of the time it's worthwhile getting all four feet done uh, and you can kind of see like you know this this is uh we're doing a study at the University of Melbourne a few years ago. Um, and so we've got a few different markers and things there. This is a horse with a, with a decent club foot with some lamella tearing at the bottom. Um, but yeah, they're just really helpful to be able to give us um, all the information that we kind of need. This, this uh, video here is just to illustrate that pain in a laminitis case isn't a very good indicator of how severe they are. So if we watch this horse walk, it's wearing some boots. It's, you know, it's a little bit ginger, but it's actually walking around, you know, for all intents and purposes, pretty well. Doesn't really like turning, doing a tight circle, which a number of laminitis cases don't really enjoy. But at the end of the day, you know, he's kind of getting around, not too bad. And we're probably thinking, oh, well, he, he looks pretty happy. Oh no, I didn't put the x-rays in. <laughs> Where are they? Oh, no, they're not there. Oh, that was silly. Anyway, that horse, had some, that horse had some very significant rotation. Probably very similar. The x-rays look very similar to that. So that horse was walking around in those boots actually pretty comfortably, but its x-ray looked very, very similar to this. Its pedal bone was only a couple of millimetres coming out the bottom of its sole. So, Lameness is not always a good indicator of, um, you know, how these horses are traveling. You know, I've seen pretty much, you know, the full breadth of severity on these cases. I've seen horses trot into the clinic and their hoof capsules are almost coming off. You know, some of these cases can be very severe, can be very pain free, even without any inflammatory. So it's not a great indicator for, um, you know, their prognosis. One of the other diagnostics that we use, which we talked about earlier, is this thing called a venogram, where we inject this dye into their vein. We've got a tourniquet up here, so all of this stuff doesn't leak too far up the leg. This is a very healthy foot. This is a normal venogram. You can see all the blood supply to the coronary band, down into the lamella attachment, all supplying the sole. But this sort of stuff is, you know, if your foot looks like this on a venogram, this is a very, very healthy foot. This, this foot down here is a horse with chronic laminitis. It's got a reduction in blood supply to the coronary band. And this is probably one of the reasons why they don't produce new hoof wall and um, they eventually deteriorate. We've got stretching and tearing of the blood supply in this region. And we've got some compression underneath the tip of our pedal bone as well. So these venograms, <coughs> these special x-rays, are really helpful for deciding what we're gonna do with these cases and how they're progressing. So how to treat laminitis um, in the developmental stage, the acute phase, the chronic phase, and identifying and managing um, multiple risk factors. This is a horse that had some very severe lamella damage in this region. You can see there's all this gas shadowing and had massive abscesses all coming out of the sole. But the top, you know, sort of third of this is a very healthy, normal foot. So, you know, depending on what stage they're in, will determine what we kind of do with a number of these cases. So the developmental phase, so your horse is happy and healthy, apart from the fact maybe it's got sepsis associated, you know, it's got some septic focus, it's in a hospital. This is when we can use cryotherapy, so icing the legs. And the whole idea around cryotherapy is it reduces the inflammatory cascade. So if we've got a horse that's sick in hospital, it might have diarrhea, we put it in these ice boots and just try and reduce the amount of inflammation that's running around in the horse's legs. And so 
you know, there's been a lot of research on using cryotherapy. It's very effective in the developmental phase. Once we start to get into the acute phase, it's helpful from a pain relief point of view, but it's not necessarily going to change how that laminitic episode ends up going down the track. And once you take them out of the ice boots, uh, they become really quite painful. So ice boots in the developmental phase, but not necessarily helpful any time outside of that. And then we've got hoof support in general. Um, you might have seen we had some wedge teal cuffs. You can put them in sand. Um, you can use dental and pressure material. There's lots of different boots out on the market that you could put your horse in. But realistically, if we're in the developmental phase, um, you know, we sort of need to know what our foot kind of looks like in the first place and work out what we're going to do for it, just in general. Then once we get into the acute phase, again, we can still use the cryotherapy. It can be a bit of a help with pain relief, but outside of that, not necessarily that helpful. Hoof support, this is, our, this is a soft ride boot, very soft, takes a lot of the sting out of the ground, but not necessarily helpful long term because they can get a bit of overload when they're standing in that. This is what we call an ultimate wedge heel cuff that was developed in America. The whole idea around this wedge is that it really, really loads up the back part of the foot and reduces the strain on that deep digital flexor tendon that can be part of pulling that pedal bone away from the hoof capsule. A lot of times in the acute phase, again, we're looking at the conformation of the horse's foot, the limb, um, what its hoof health is like to begin with, and trying to come up with the best possible solution. Um, a lot of times we'll particularly if we're in a hospital and they start to develop acute laminitis. Sometimes it's just nice to put them in sand for a couple of days just to reduce the inflammation. While they're in the acute phase, no matter whether they've got metabolic associated sepsis, you know, confinement's really important. We don't want these things turned out into a paddock when they're at this stage because that lamellar attachment's really fragile. Typically when they're in the acute phase, you definitely don't want to be nailing shoes onto these guys. Again, they're very painful. You usually have to sedate them. Sometimes you have to nerve block them. So using some sort of support boot in this period of time is really helpful. And I am, um, unless the horse has very overgrown and really long feet, I'm very reluctant to trim in that first 72 hours. Try not to trim the foot at all. This, this slide just illustrates some of the different types of things that we can use. Um, this is a soft flooring and it changes the angle of the pedal bone. These are these ultimate wedge steel cuffs which you know change the angle about 16 degrees. And these are these soft rides that kind of, you know, they kind of sink into that area, uh, sink into the boot itself. The chronic cases, you know, there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to these sort of cases. There's like literally, you know, hundreds of different shoes and hundreds of different protocols for shoeing and trimming these cases. But for the most part, you know, our, our, our real aims for these cases, one is to just reduce the breakover. And so that's, you know, where the toe interacts with the ground surface. If we're dealing with a horse with a lot of rotation, we want to load up the back part of the foot. If you remember one of those venograms, it didn't have a lot of blood supply to the front part of the foot, but man, did it have a lot of good blood supply to the back part. So if we can shift load to the heels and to the frogs, that's really helpful. And then the third thing is, if we can reduce the strain on the tendon that now is trying to pull that bone towards the ground surface, we can really help out a lot of these cases. And so the way that we can reduce strain on the tendon is to provide some heel elevation, which reduces the, tendon, the length that the tendon has to kind of go around. So, using wedges or wedge teal shoes or wedge teal cuffs are really helpful for these type of cases. Now, there is other different forms of laminitis and they can, um, some horses will sink and you know, they'll have a lot of compression in the back part of their foot. Some horses will displace one side over the other. So there's a lot of different techniques when we start to get into the complexities. But if our aim is to ease the break over, shift weight to the back part of the foot and reduce some tension on that tendon, that gets you a long way down the track in improving these cases. Um, using x-rays like we talked about, one for diagnosis, but then two for monitoring these cases moving forward, either taking the x-ray after we've trimmed and shod the foot or taking x-rays six weeks down the track when they're due for reshoeing can be really helpful at, at aiming, at, at, you know, sort of moving these horses forward. Um, 
lots of different types of shoes. These are just four different styles of half bar shoes. So if you ever see this, you know, the branches of the shoe and they're kind of joined together and then we've got this sort of frog support sitting in the middle here. That's what we term a half bar and there's lots of different shapes and designs out there on the market. In the chronic cases, you know, obviously we can have some of these cases barefoot. Many of the smaller ponies that I deal with, they don't typically wear shoes. One, because man, they're hard to find shoes for a mini pony. And then two, they actually grow a lot of new hoof capsule really quickly. So if we're putting a shoe on there, we're actually stopping the foot from wearing it all. And so you get to the end of your trimming, your shoeing cycle and these ponies are walking around with flippers because they just grow so much hoof capsule so quickly. I think if we've got, you know, a 750 kilo warm blood <coughs> with rotation at three mils of sole before its pedal bone comes out the bottom of its foot, barefoot's not necessarily going to be a great, there's not going to be a great result for that horse. But some of these smaller horses and depending on how chronic they are and how much sole depth they have, certainly can be man maintained barefoot. The use of anti-inflammatory, so Butte, um, there's a new anti-inflammatory out called um, Previcox or Prev Equine. They can be really helpful in reducing the inflammatory cascade. So, you know, we use a lot of anti-inflammatories. One, so your horse is not walking around crippled. Uh, and then two, so that, you know, it just stops that inflammatory cascade going uh, down the track. Obviously, you know, there's, if you're dealing with a really severe case, no amount of anti-inflammatories is going to make them walk around. You know, they're really difficult to kind of deal with. So I don't get too concerned about them overloading their feet. But if we have a period of confinement while they're unstable, that's probably more helpful. And then we get into the weird and wonderful world of these really severe cases where um, sometimes we've got a lot of rotation, the horse is incredibly painful. We'll actually do a small incision over the deep digital flexor tendon that's running through here in the level of the cannon bone. We'll actually cut that tendon in half. Um, that's the superficial flexor tendon that you can see there. But see how there's that big black hole there? That's after we cut through the tendon and the tendon probably spread about 20 millimetres. So by cutting through the tendon, all of a sudden now, we don't have that tendon pulling the bone towards the ground surface and pulling it away from the hoof wall. And that can be really helpful in some of our chronic cases, some of our severe cases, and some horses that develop, that are retired, that, that have a club foot and also have laminitis and have a lot of rotation, and we don't want to keep shoeing them all the time. We can use things like hoof casts or lower limb casts to try and support them a little bit more, depending on the severity. And then, you know, we can get into some really crazy looking designs for some of these more severe cases to try and stabilize them as well. So just finally, just sort of managing the metabolic associated case, you know, these horses with either EMS, equine metabolic syndrome or Cushing's. And I think I see a particular subset of them. We've got the overweight EMS cases. They're like body condition score seven, eight, nine out of nine. You know, they're really overweight. Some EMS cases though are a good weight, but they have these things called regional adiposity, so fat pads. So I'll have a crest to their neck. They might have some fat pads behind their shoulder blade or over their tail head. So, but you can see their ribs. So they're not actually that overweight, but they are storing fat in weird locations. We'll see these overweight Cushing's horses. They typically also have EMS, but then we'll also see the older horse that's underweight and has Cushing's. And so managing these metabolic cases can be a little bit tricky depending on what sort of category they slip into. But basically diet, you know, you have, if you've got a horse that has EMS, you have to be like a detective when it comes to feeding these things because even a sniff of too much non-structural carbohydrates can tip them over the edge. And so you need to look at your pasture or how much they turned out on pasture. Pasture is so variable, it's just ridiculous in terms of trying to manage an EMS uh, case on there. So, you know, maybe restricting their pasture intake. Looking at their hay is very important, particularly here in Victoria. If we're looking at grass hay, because everyone says grass hay is great for laminitic ponies, unfortunately in Victoria we mainly create, you know, we cut rye grass hay, which has a huge amount of non-structural carbohydrates in it. So getting your hay tested, ideally, or buying already tested hay is important, and then looking at their hard feed. And Holly can talk a little bit more about that sort of stuff. For me, if I'm dealing with an uncontrolled EMS overweight case, 
I really want my non-structural carbohydrates to be less than 6% and I think that's really important. Obviously there's lots of supplements on the market for foot growth, um, you know, there's so many of the different ones out there now, it's a bit mind blowing, but you know, if you're providing some level of biotin and methionine, I think that's really important for hoof health. Exercising these cases is important as long as they're stable and they're growing new hoof capsule. If they're a severe case and their pedal bones rotating out the bottom of their foot, exercising them is not a great idea. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. And then we can use drugs to manage some of these conditions. So equine Cushing's, we can use a drug called Pergolite or Crescent, it comes as a, as a liquid or it comes as a little tablet. And in our EMS cases, we can use two human drugs. One's called Metformin, and if any of you have used Metformin in, in horses, it's a real pain because you have to use about 20 tablets a day and crush them up uh, and then feed them to your horse. It's not, really, it's not really a great solution. But now there's a new drug out called Atugliflozin. It's a silly name and most people will not remember it at all. But this is a new drug that they've been using in type 2 diabetic patients. And I've found, I've been using it for about six months in horses. And it's been very effective for dealing with our EMS cases and, and managing not only their EMS, but their subsequent laminitis. Mm -hmm. Monitoring response to treatment is really important with x-rays. And this is just an example of a horse that was severely rotated. We set it up in this wedge heel shoe in this realignment shoeing where we create actually an air gap underneath the tip of the pedal bone. So we, we glue this on in a particular way so there's nothing underneath the sole. And this is basically what the foot looks like in six weeks time where we've filled in all this sole and it's all grown back again. So using x-rays to one, diagnose, two, set your shoe up, and then three, monitor it later on down the track is really helpful. Finally, prevention. Well, it'd be great if we could prevent all these cases from happening in the first place. Uh, but at this point in time, it's really difficult to do that because like we've discussed today, there's so many different risk factors associated with laminitis, so it makes it really tricky. I think the only way that we can really, um, truly prevent it is to identify risk factors early. You know, is my horse all of a sudden putting on weight because it's out on green pasture during spring? Hey, maybe it has a bit of underlying EMS. Uh, is it retaining its hair coat uh, coming into spring and it's old? Maybe it's got Cushing's. Is it sick and it's developed um, you know, laminitis because it's got a septic focus? So identifying risk factors early is really important. You know, seeing your horse is not quite right and it's in a bit of pain, you know, getting your vet involved is, is helpful in the early phases. If we wait too long, it's a, re it's a real problem. Regular you know, hoof trimming or, or shoeing or regular foot care is really important. You know, if we can have a nice, sturdy, healthy foot that looks something like that, and it develops laminitis, that's, that's not as big a deal as if we're dealing with something like this or it's got really beat up walls or it's got no sole or you know, it's, in a real, it's in a real problem already. If it has poor hoof health but it develop, lab, develops laminitis, that's a big problem. Like we discussed, hoof supplements definitely can be helpful and just monitoring your horses on a regular basis is, uh, is a good thing to do. So take home messages from today. Monitoring horses for lameness and signs of laminitis. We've talked about some of the clinical signs that we can see. Identifying these risk factors and trying to prevent the exposure of them. So if your horse is putting on weight on green grass, getting them off of the grass is gonna be helpful. Involve your veterinarian and farrier or hoof care professional in the treatment and hopefully the prevention of the laminitic episode. And remember that timeline of laminitis. It's not, you know, we've got the developmental phase, we've got the acute phase that lasts three days and then we've got that chronic phase. And if your horse has developed chronic laminitis and it's going up and down in its pain, it's not really growing new hoof, um, and it's happening over a six to eight week period, you really need to start thinking about getting some foot x-rays. Um, and I think the final take home thing that, um, you know, I think we all struggle with with a lot of these cases is treating laminitis takes a lot of patience. In a normal horse, it takes a full 12 months to grow out your hoof capsule. So if you've had a laminitic episode and you've got to grow out that entire la laminar wedge, it's gonna take a full 12 months at least to grow it out. It doesn't mean that you can't ride the horse before the end of the 12 months or before it's you know, completely regrown its hoof capsule, but it takes a lot of time. And in particular, in the early phases, if they're a severe case, 
you know, sometimes we won't even trim these feed for three or four months. That's how long it starts to regenerate some of these cases. So that's all that I've got for tonight.